Today's episode of the podcast is brought to you by Coach Me Plus. Coach Me Plus is the leader in athlete management software and a product that we've been lucky enough to implement here for over two years now. The product in and of itself is exactly what you need it to be, guys, with options ranging from being a workout provider, as in sending the workout directly to the student athlete's phones, to being a place where you can communicate with them and bring together multiple streams of data to be its own dashboard for you, your coaching staff, or the athletes. Or you can use what we've added to our our menu of Coach Me Plus activities, and that's Hydration Station, where all of this information that is provided is based off of research from the Corey Stringer Institute, where we're looking at weighing in versus weighing out and then providing optimal hydration uh, strategies for the student athletes by them selecting through the menu and tapping on what they'll take home with them and what they're consuming prior to the next practice um, when all the numbers at the top are lined up green. It's something we've had really good success with and the kids have really bought in on. Just another great example of the awesome product that you can find at coachmeplus.com. Guys, hop over to coachmeplus.com today and check it out. It's a product I guarantee you won't be disappointed with. Hey, everybody. If you enjoy the podcast and the content it provides, be sure to hop over and check out the community. The community is an exclusive members website that is just an extension of what we do here in July at the Central Virginia Sport Performance Seminar. What it is is a combination of video lectures, a coach's corner with your Monday morning take-home information, and a forum where you can talk about anything and everything related to the field of strength and conditioning. In the community, you'll find content added each month from some of the top practitioners in the world, ranging from PhDs to high-level coaches, bringing you exactly what they're doing with their athletes or their research at the present moment. On top of that, an additional discussion by coaches bringing you that Monday morning information things that you can add to your training program right away. Tying that in with the opportunity to discuss with coaches around the world in the forum on anything and everything from the topics addressed in these presentations to whatever you're seeing in your daily life as a coach. If this sounds like the right thing for you and your staff, go ahead and hop over to cvasps.com slash community and try it out for 48 hours for just a dollar. If you like it, you're signed up, ready to roll, and you're jumping into all the great content added each month. If not, feel free to go ahead and cancel at any time. No questions asked. We're really excited about what we're building in the community and hope you are too. Go ahead and hop over to cvasps.com slash community and check it out today. Hello and welcome to the podcast. Today, guys, we have an absolutely fantastic discussion with BCI Sport Performance and Fitness's Andy McCloy. And Andy and I are just going to sit down and talk about the world of training and get into some of the the facets that he sees from the private sector versus what we see in, you know, the college sector on a daily basis. After a real quick intro, we're going to start talking about the role of his facility, and and not just when it comes to developing athletes physically, but really more on like a a whole self-type way that they're doing things and building culture with kids. It's really awesome. Next, we get into talking about, you know, where you know the role the private market trainer is and where it fits in this world of athletic development in conjunction with you know their these kids sport coaches and strength coaches at their schools and other aspects of their lives and things of that nature and then guys we get into the the real nitty-gritty of how Andy programs and what he's looking at and how they develop programs from how they screen kids to get them to be part of their program to how they evaluate them when they're in the program, to exercise selection, regressions, progressions, and, and the whole nine yards. This is really an awesome talk, guys. I, I hope you enjoyed it as much as I did. Let's get right to it. Andy, thank you so much for being on with us today, man. Thank you very much. So we got the energy picked up there fast. <laughs> oh, yeah, man. I'm actually excited for this. This has been a long time coming. And, like, we were just yeah. kind of half joking about off camera. Like, we – like it's not even like six degrees of separation. It's like 61 degrees of separation <laughs> to get this down. So yeah. let's give everybody like the quick cliff notes version, like the 1% of people listening right now that don't yeah. know who Andy is and what's going on down there at, at your spot. 
So uh, my name is Andy McCloy. I'm the owner of BCI Sport Performance and Fitness. Technically, uh, BCI stands for Body Creations Incorporated. Uh, when I initially started my company back 18 years ago, um, I didn't know if it was going to be sport performance driven or not. I really wanted to build like franchise prototypes for gyms. And um, around 2004, 2005, um, I kind of had this epiphany by way of working with high school athletes that I could use my own personal experience and story to help mentor kids and improve the quality of their life by way of the training process. And I just, I went all in on that uh, from there. And, you know, ever since, you know, that time we've, you know, I, I don't want to say we've dominated this market, but we've been one of the more prominent facilities uh, in the state of the Alabama or in the state of Alabama. Um, we've worked with well over a hundred kids that have received college scholarships. We've had seven different kids drafted into the NFL over the past five years. And we've got a really unique mix of people here. And, and we don't exclude the general population anymore. We've actually kind of brought them back into our facility uh, over the past couple of years as well. Um, yeah, I mean, that, that's the one minute overview of, you know, who I am and, and what we've done. The one thing that I always think of when I think of BCI is that there's some ballers that come out of there. Yeah, I mean, I – there's, I remember way back in the day, you would remember this, like I say way back in the day, like 2000, 2001. I remember two guys that I, I really like and have respect for, Joe DeFranco and Zach Ebenash. They um, both were talking about like bringing their athletes together to compete against each other at Joe's place. And I think they actually mm -hmm. did do that at one point. And I, I've always thought, you know, I should throw my hat in the ring here because I, there's just not many facilities across this country that have the type of athletes that we have. And that has a lot to do with geography and where I live and um, I, I'd like to think we've done some things to position ourselves to get those kids because they are the best of the best. But um, this area is full of talent, and uh, we, we've got them top to bottom. I mean, from yesterday we had kids from Florida, Alabama, Vanderbilt, Western Kentucky, Tulane. I mean, they just – they pour in here, you know. And it's in all sports, not just football, but basketball, baseball, and a little bit of everything. Yeah, no, that's awesome. And then the culture just breeds more and more excitement. It, it really does. Um, that's one thing I've been talking a lot about is culture. It's like, you know, it's not like I'm a, a culture expert. Like I never set out to like develop a cool culture. It just kind of has organically happened where, you know, we have some of the best kids in the world, but we'll put them in the same group with kids who are not even close to the type of athlete that they are. And even at their school, they're not as like socially um, intertwined with all the, the cool stuff going on. And I think there's a unique dynamic there where those kids are able to like socially level up uh, the kids that are studs are put in a position where they have to coach and mentor younger people. And uh, it's just a really cool thing. That's awesome. And I can imagine, too, that not just the social aspect, but the performance aspect for those more lower level kids goes through the roof, too. It does. I mean, and I think what it is, they quit comparing themselves, right? They quit worrying about where they fit in. They kind of know, like, if they're working with a kid like LeBron Ray at Alabama, like, they, they know they're not going to out-squat him right? So they can kind of get out of their own head and just focus on their own production and effort. Uh, and I do think that has a lot of benefit. Now, you're also doing some other cool stuff when it comes to kind of the separation, if we may, between the two fields. Let's get into that, because I think that this is something that, I mean, we could talk training all day, but I think this is a message that needs to be brought to coaches. Yeah, yeah. So, I mean, I think that the private market facility generally gets a bad rap. I think coaches in the private market, um, you know, and listen, this goes both ways. Like there's been guys in the private market that take shots at high school, college, and professional coaches. And then there's professional college and high school coaches that take shots at people in the private market. And I've, I've just really never understood that. And, and we're doing our best to collaborate with as many people as possible. We'll get on the phone with anybody, talk to anybody. I want, I want those coaches respect and trust. And I think when you can build that bridge, um, it's just in the benefit of the athlete. And that's our overarching mission is to help those athletes. I, it's not about being significant in the industry. It's about being significant in the eyes of our athletes. Yeah. So let's talk about that. How, are, how have you been reaching out? What are some examples of ways that you've been trying to bridge that gap? Because I, I think you're right. I think there's a lot of people in the college sector lack of a better term, look at people in the private sectors like poachers. Yeah. You know, yeah. so how are, how are some ways that you've reached out with coaches and, and then vice versa? What are some ways that they've reached out to you that have really helped kind of build this bridge? Um, I mean, there's been a couple ways. I'll say probably social media has made it the easiest, right? Because, like, now you can go to somebody's Instagram page and kind of get a handle of, like, 
do they really know what they're doing or Facebook or, or, or anything? So I think that now that we have a better window into each other's lives, it's a little bit easier to build trust. And then the way that we can communicate with each other um, is enhanced. So I've reached out to multiple, you know, professional strength coaches, college strength coaches, especially if we've got some of their athletes in here, just to like introduce myself to open the door and say, Hey, look, like I'm not trying to take over anything you got going on. Uh, we're trying to be the supplement to whatever you guys are doing. Um, and I just want you to feel good about it. Um, the other thing is I'm, I'm pretty ruthless about like attending seminars and I've met a lot of coaches that way. And like we talk about, like some of the best relationships are formed at the end of those conferences, having a beer or a meal where people kind of let their guards down and you can get to know each other better and, you know, figure out each other's paradigm of, uh, how the training process works. Um, and then visiting schools. I, I've had the luxury of, uh, spending a lot of time, um, at Vanderbilt because of one of the NFL athletes that I've worked with, he's an alum there. And I've got to meet Coach Dobbs and Rex and their whole staff. And um, it was a weird thing. Here I am, a private market guy, you know, coming into their facility to work with an NFL guy. And I was incredibly worried about how that would be perceived. Um, to those guys' credits, they're, they're nothing but class acts. Um, they've received me and welcomed me and treated me uh, in, incredibly well. So I think sometimes just having the courage to go get in front of those guys and humble yourself and realize they've got just as much to offer you and the athlete you're working with as you do. So. Now, it seems more and more it's becoming less commonplace for athletes to be home for the summer or go somewhere else. But for those guys that you have, like you said, you, get, you had people from, from Vandy, Alabama, Florida, Tulane. Yep, uh, Western Kentucky. Yeah, the Hilltoppers. Even a kid from Richmond a week or two ago. Oh, yeah. And it's yeah. how do you work? Because that, that's an interesting predicament to me because now you've got – You've got, we said six different schools. Yep. So you've got six different programs and you've got guys there with you because they want to train with you. Yeah. How does that work? How do you communicate that with their people and how do they handle those situations? So some of these athletes have been with us since they were in sixth, seventh grade. Um, when they come home, a lot of times they're being told – I believe to the coach's credit, like it's time for you to not bang. It's time for you to relax. So I think during these short off periods like this, we have the luxury of not worrying so much about reaching out and communicating because the coaches don't expect them to do much. And they really just want them to rest and relax. And we follow along with that, you know, and out of those six different schools, those guys are in six different situations. You know, one of them's a sophomore, one of them's a freshman, one of them's got a broken foot, you know, so we modify the program and meet the kids where they are with an understanding that this is not the time to smash a kid and create Instagram and YouTube worthy videos just because they've shown up in your facility for a couple of weeks. Um, in fact, everything that we do with these guys is very unsexy um, this time of year. You know, um, We're just trying to get some load off their body, increase aerobic capacity, keep patterning the right stuff, and make sure that they don't lose too much strength while they're home visiting their friends, girlfriends, moms, and everything else. No, I love that. And I, and I think that that's got to go a long way to continue to develop that relationship with the athlete you have and to build a relationship with the coaches that they're working with elsewhere. It does. I mean, like I, the, the big thing, like with our athletes, they trust us almost, um, you know, I would say maybe even to the detriment of the college program at the time. Right. Cause if I've been, if I've had a kid for eight, nine years, he's heavily skewed towards the way we do things, you know? So a lot of times when kids come home, we end up kind of translating, for the college coach like we're, we're explaining to them why they're doing what they're doing at college and why it's necessary for that amount of stress to be imposed on them even though when they trained here we couldn't do that well we didn't have the luxury of owning their strength and conditioning they were doing stuff at high school and that could range from having a good high school strength coach to somebody that's doing let's just say random chaotic stuff um so we can never really train them as hard as we wanted to train them we have to always kind of abide by that minimal effective dose, uh, lowest system load mentality um, because we just don't control what they do. So when our kids come home, a lot of times they, they don't understand why they're being trained so hard and pushed so hard. And we certainly don't try to step on the coach's toes. We, we try to bridge that gap and explain to them why this is so necessary. It's not that what we do is better or what they do is wrong. It's, it's all necessary and it's all part of their evolution as an athlete and their development. That's interesting. So then how do you handle, because we all, 
in the profession now, we like to talk about minimal effective dose and, and what it is and how it means to you or me or everyone else. But how do you handle that as kind of that supporter in, in that high school kid when, when they also have whatever they're doing with their other team? Well, I mean, I, I think it starts with the relationship and your ability to communicate to the kid why you're doing what you're doing. Um, you know, and I, again, it's easier if the kid's been in our program because he's kind of always been introduced to that, that way of training. Um, you know, using an RPE scale, I think, has value in it. It connects with them. Um, making sure that we limit the volume as a whole to, you know, four, maybe five sets on certain exercises. Auxiliary is more like two to three. This lends itself to the mind of the young athlete. They, they want to train less intense. So it's, it's a pretty easy sell on our end of why we approach things the way we do. Like, I, I believe it's a much harder sell to get them to understand why they need to get smashed every now and then. Oh, yeah, no doubt about it. So then when you're connecting those dots and you're bringing those things together, where, where are some spots that you have had some success with in those troubleshooting type times? Can you help me out a little bit more? Give me a little bit more of a specific way to uh, answer that question. Oh, so like those high school kids that they're coming in, right? And they're getting, they're getting after it with what they're doing at school. And then they're yep. coming in to, to train with you. How, how do you, what are some ways that you've had like good success coming back and handling those situations? Okay. Yeah. Okay. That, that helps. Um, so first of all, when you, when you have a, a business of this size and you're dealing with groups of athletes, uh, like eight to 12 kids at a time, you need a system and you need a template that everybody operates off of. Okay. Um, so for example, after we do um, what we use Mike Robertson's R6 model, what he calls R7. So R1 is going to be release work. We're going to foam roll. R2 is going to be reset work, primarily breathing resets that are individualized based on our evaluation process. Then we go into our ramp, which is like our dynamic warm up, our movement prep work, our mock drills, kind of like speed prep work as well. Then we get into reactive and we're sprinting, we're jumping and we're throwing or, or doing multi-directional stuff. It's very easy to keep everybody on the same page there because time doesn't allow you to have enough volume uh, to where I really feel it can impact them in, in a negative way. We, we've got to squeeze a lot of work into a short period of time. Then when we get to the R5, which is the strength training side of things, this is where a coach has to know his athletes and the athlete has to be able to understand at least the exercises that were performed that day. So if a kid is power clean that day and our A1 is going to be what we call an explosive, like it literally says explosive exercise, right? So if a kid has power clean that day, he's not going to power clean anymore. But ways that we can, you know, use this lowest uh, system load approach or minimal effective dose is one, med ball throws, two, technique work, right? Those two things alone, I don't think a young athlete can get enough of, and they have a minimal effect on his ability to recover. Same thing as we kind of move down the chain. If we're in a B1 and it's going to be a bilateral quad dominant, there's a pretty good chance this kid is squatted that day. But we can get away with an off-rack kettlebell squat. You can build a little bit more volume into that because the intensity is not so high. So we end up choosing exercises that they don't do at school. And I, I think that that in and of itself um, has had a huge benefit. Now, if you'd asked me this 10 years ago, I looked at this totally differently. If a kid squatted at school, we were probably still going to hit a 5RM, but we were just we were going to box squat. We were going to use a special exercise. Um, if a kid bench pressed at school, we were probably going to go two board, three board, something along those lines. And I just, after doing that long enough and being able to objectively evaluate the athletes that we had, their injuries, um, the way they were performing, I felt like we dropped the ball there. We were screwing up. We, we were making it about us, not so much about the athlete. I was worried about doing things the way the people I respected did them. And we were very, very West Side driven, you know, going back, you know, 10 plus years ago, the way we were doing things. And that's to say nothing negative about West Side. I just don't think you can take um, that system or methodology and apply it in the private market uh, the way a lot of people try to. Oh, I couldn't agree more with that. And I, you know, as a, a guy that we both hold in very, very high regard says there's, there's only one way to train West side and that's to go to Columbus. And, uh, if you haven't been the minute you walk in, you don't have a choice but to train at West side because we yeah. have to let you walk around there for long. Before you get to the squad. I have not had a chance to train there yet, but I've got a good friend named Rob Pilger that trains there. He's a boxing guy there. And I know JL Holdsworth real well. So like, I actually have to have – I need both my hips replaced. So I'm, I'm waiting on a bilateral hip replacement, which I'll probably get done this year. 
Uh, but at some point, I will definitely make sure I, I get to West Side and step under the bar and try my best not to embarrass myself. You know? Yeah. I did plenty of that for both of us when I was up there. <laughs> <laughs> but let's, let's go back a little bit. You were talking a little bit about evaluations, and that, that always sparks my interest. Let's talk about what you're looking at there with that R2. So the way that our evaluation works, um, well, first of all, it's an evaluation of whether or not you're a good fit for our program or not. We, we start with what we call an intake interview. Uh, we bring mom, dad, and the kid in. We sit them down. Uh, we explain our philosophy. We explain our program. And that in and of itself kind of cuts some people out. Some people have expectations that we're, we've got to smash their kid or they need this super individualized program. And we kind of get it you know, out up front that that's just not what we do. And we tell them why. Um, at the end of that meeting, if we both think the kid's a good fit for our program, the next stage is for us to evaluate him from a movement-based standpoint. We don't, we don't really evaluate performance indicators because, again, I don't have ownership over everything that they're doing. So like our program could be doing things that we believe should improve these benchmarks, but if they're doing something at school that takes away from that, I don't want mom and dad looking at me crazy like we're the ones that didn't do our job. So Again, in years past, we used to 10-yard dash, broad jump, vertical jump, multi-vert, multi-broad. Those were kind of our main performance indicators. And we usually had pretty respectable weight room numbers just by way of being able to evaluate that during training. But we moved to more of a movement-based approach. Um, so we use like a modified FMS. Um, we do a couple of PRI tests, uh, like adductor drop test, Thomas test. Uh, we will evaluate um, their ability to rotate joints. If you're familiar with FRC, functional range conditioning. So we'll have them do cars on all their main joints just to kind of see what things look like. Um, we do do some table tests for shoulder internal rotation, external rotation, hip internal, hip, uh, hip external. Uh, we'll do a toe touch test, uh, standing overhead test. And then we use all of that information to drive at least some level of specificity into what they're doing in their training program. And again, if you're working with eight to 12 athletes, I'm not hearing that you have a super individualized program. If you do, you're really rich and you've got a lot of people on staff that are making that work because it's an incredibly hard thing to do and manage once you have, you know, hundred plus athletes, you know, in your program. So we bucket guys generally into two groups. We'll bucket them into a hip group or a shoulder group. And then during R2, we're going to use some type of breathing reset to one, establish good, you know, rib cage and pelvis position, which, is the key, right? So proximal stability leads to distal mobility. You know, most people know that Stuart McGill quote. So if we lock that down first, get them in a better position, usually we get better movement out of those joints anyway. But then we, we try to hammer that home more with a corrective exercise based on whether they need a shoulder corrective, a hip corrective, or possibly even both. And then we can break that out a little bit further for guys like, for example, like if we've got a basketball kid who has limited ankle mobility, we might build in some ankle rocks or other ankle mobilization drills like pails and rails, you know, into that aspect of the program as well. I love it. And then, so that carries all the way through then those evaluations, like even into your explosive and then your, your normal lift. Absolutely. So if a kid is one of those shoulder guys, he's probably not going overhead. Right. And we're usually going to try to add another corrective paired up with a strength exercise, a non-competing strength exercise uh, in his R5 template as well. So how do you dictate those? So do you pretty much have that kind of templated out or do you like, are there like some plug and plays with individual kids or is it more of just, uh, I don't know, like almost like a cash grab, you know, like how it's like, let's see if this works and move forward. I mean, I've done all three. So I'm just curious to see how you guys do that. So every kid has a workout card here. So they have their card. Um, after their evaluation, our program design director builds out their program based on that evaluation. Now, we do provide them with choice. So, you know, we will give a kid a choice. Like, for example, the lowest system load example of, like, med ball throws um, or technique work. You know, I'm okay with whatever he wants to do. Because generally, if the kid's technique solid, he's probably choosing the med balls, right? <laughs> and, you know, so we, we give them autonomy and choice. Like, I don't – if a kid wants to go double kettlebell – uh, versus a uh, safety bar front squat, I'm okay with either, especially since I know he's already getting some work done, you know, at school. I don't know if that answered your question or not, but, no. you know, and then we have a baseline regression progression model, similar to what Mike Boyle recommends as well. So when a kid comes in, if it's the first time he's ever trained, his options on exercises are limited by that, right? There's a baseline we feel he should be able to do. We've already got a pre-planned regression to go to. And we've got a progression in mind if we need to slide them up on that scale as well. 
No, I love that. And I love the fact that you're giving them the autonomy. Like, how much of that is earned? Or is all of that pretty much, you know, that is something you allow almost from the beginning? It's a very individual thing. We do allow some in the beginning, but we open it up a lot more the longer the kid's been in our program, for sure. No, I love it. How is that with them then? I guess this is a two-part question then. How, how long does it take for them to actually understand, like, your principles and where you're going that you – trust them to make that decision and then once they're starting to make that decision how big of an impact does that have on them training wise i'll be honest i I don't i think we got a ton of kids that still have no idea why we do it they they don't they you know they they don't understand why and um you know with certain people i'm not so sure it has value explaining it to them but then there are other kids that they need that right you know so like they they need to understand the x's and o's behind what you're doing what I've found is those kids, you can open things up faster and has a much larger impact on them. Whereas there's certain kids, and one female hockey player comes to mind, I won't name her, but um, we got to tell her exactly what to do, like exactly what to do. She doesn't want to make a choice. And in fact, she'll go to one of our kids and say, just, just tell me, just tell me what to do. And, and we'll tell her what to do. So it is a very individualized thing based on the athlete that you're dealing with. But that makes it sound a lot more complex than it really is, you know. Oh, yeah, no, 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 and I'm with you, and I think that that's funny, like, bringing that story up, because, I mean, even with, I've got, like, eight guys coming back here in a week, and it's, there's two that'll train together that are exactly like that, one that's, like, wants to know everything and has input on everything, and and, and the other one is just, like, I don't care, just tell me. (laughs) <laughs> yeah, I'm, I'm a ball player. I'm not a weightlifter. Just tell me what to do. Yeah. yeah. Tell yeah. me how this is going to help me. Okay. Yeah. Then I'll go do it. Got it. Yep. 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 So then moving forward, where, where do you see things going with Andy down there in Alabama? We're going to continue to grow. Um, I mean, I, I've said from the beginning, like I want to create the greatest gym in the state of Alabama. And, um, you know, I, I want this to become a destination facility. I want it to become a hub of education for trainers that want to get in the private market, um, whether that's people that are coming up through school and know that's where they want to be or college coaches that may want to stick their foot in this world and, you know, see what it's like. Um, you know, we plan to do that. We plan to expand this facility and there's a possibility of us doing two others uh, in two other major facilities. We, we've already had um, talks about it with, with other people. So, um, I plan on being around in this industry for a really long time. And I, I just want to be a, a mentor to young coaches, the way that, you know, guys have mentored me, like, you know, coach Ken and um, you know, just, I've, I've really benefited from not even so much direct mentorship, but just their, the relationship and, and the guidance that I've been able to get by way of that. And I, I want to be that guy for a lot of coaches. Yeah, man. I love it. Keep up the good fight, man. Cause there's, what you're doing is appreciated and this message that you're pushing is, is important. And it's, it's something that all too often, unfortunately, the reason there are thoughts and stereotypes and things like that and thoughts in each direction is because there are people on both sides of the fence that are like that. You're right. But the more that we can find the people that are fighting the good fight, pushing things forward the right way, the better we are, man. And I appreciate you keep doing what you're doing, bro. That means a lot coming from you. It really does. It absolutely does. Well, thanks, man. Well, thank you so much for being on. This is fantastic, man. People are going to love it. Yeah. Yeah, I, I mean, I'm really excited. This is, this is one of those ones I told my staff last week. Like, this is one of those podcasts like I've, I've wanted to get on, you know. So it, it was an honor for you to reach out, and uh, I really appreciate it. And uh, I'm looking forward to, you know, listening to it myself. I, I rarely ever go back and listen to myself on podcasts, but, you know, I, I, I'm definitely going to go back and listen to this one. Oh, appreciate it, man. Well, thank you so much for being on. We'll be in touch real soon, brother. All right, Jay. Thanks, man. Yep. And a huge thank you to Andy McCloy for spending the time with us today. Open, honest, candid, just laying it out there from everything to where he sees the world of training and where he fits in it and what they're trying to do to make sure that kids are developing properly to every aspect of how he develops these athletes. I just, if you guys want to know what a person does with training, I mean, there it is right there. Open, honest, candid sharing. Andy, I cannot thank you enough for, for just laying it all out there with us today and, and being so so forward and open with, with everything that you're doing and sharing. Keep up the great fight down there in Alabama, man. It's greatly appreciated. And uh, I, I can't thank you enough for everything you're doing, brother. And as always, guys, 
If you enjoyed the talk, please share it through the social media outlet of your choice, Facebook, Twitter, Instagram, whatever it may be. If you know somebody that could take something from this talk, tag them underneath it. Tweet it at them. Shoot them a DM with it. Email them the talk. Whatever it is. As always, we're just trying to get the best information out there to all the fantastic coaches that we can. And as always, guys, thank you for everything that you do for us here at Central Virginia Sport Performance. We will be back next week with another awesome guest. We will see you then.